We're in a series this week, we're coming to the end of the series, called Undisturbed, Undisturbed. And if you haven't been with us, if you have been with us, you're probably tired of hearing this, but if you haven't, uh, basically what we've been talking about, to catch you up real quick, is this idea, right? So if you think of 2021, if you had to, des- to describe 2021 in one word, capture the whole idea in just one word, how would you describe it? We, we sent out this question on social media and it was amazing. Like pretty much across the board, all of the answers were really, really negative, which is understandable, especially after 2020, because that wasn't so great either, right? But the words were like difficult, challenging, uh, hard. One person just wrote, oh, like it was just overall this vibe of distress. Nobody looks at, you know, 2021 or most of us don't, at least with like positive feelings, but what we've said, what we said is like, could you imagine one year from now, or at this point, a little bit less than one year from now, when we're in, at, in 2023, looking back at 2022, could you imagine, could you imagine if somebody asked you to describe 2022 in one word and looking back at this whole year, through the ups and downs, through the unforeseen obstacles, the difficulties, the loss, the wins and the loses, right? Could you imagine if you could look back at this year and say, you know what, honestly, honestly, in spite of all that, the one word for me is peace, peace. Though things might've been crazy at times on the outside, on the inside, there was a sense of peace. And so we've been asking like, well, what does it take to get there? What does that even look like? And, and really, really, what would you be willing to do to get there, to be able to say that? And so we started off by defining the word peace and saying, all right, if that's what we want, then we have to at least give words to this idea. Because peace is kind of a difficult thing to wrap your mind around, right? We all know it when we see it or feel it, but it's a hard thing to explain. So, okay, well, peace, really, what is peace? What is peace? And the definition that we found is this idea of everything being just right, like whole, satisfied. In fact, the ancient Hebrew word for peace is this word shalom. You might've heard it before, but it has this idea of being whole, of everything being in its right place, like, ah, just right. And then, of course, we asked the source of like all things true and good. We Googled like, what, how do you define peace? And if you ask Google or Siri or Alexa or your personal assistant of choice, uh, what we found is this definition of, like, peace is freedom from disturbance, which is the same idea. Just right. Just right. Last week, Tom described peace as, like, freedom from disturbance. He was like, it's like snow, you know, that no one has stepped in. Like, just, ah, oh, Nice. I, for the past like few weeks before that, I defined it as like a new, and I'm sticking with this one, a new jar of peanut butter. You know, you open up the top and it's just smooth, right? Undisturbed. I think that's better than the snow one. Just like, <laughs> just saying. Uh, free from disturbance. And so then the question obviously is, well, what really, if you think about it, what disturbs your peace? And the things that we talked about were not things, are not things that you might typically think disturb peace, right? Like we talked about pride. We said pride, really, when you let pride in, you push peace out. Pride and peace don't work well together. We talked about that on week one. Then the next week, we talked about something called anger, right? We've all experienced this this, to some extent or another. And when you let anger in, when you have a problem with anger, you push peace out. The two don't work well together. And then from there, we talked about shame, this feeling of never measuring up, of always being inadequate, never quite being able to like reach the bar, no matter, maybe it's in the area of like school or work or home, but just never quite feeling like you're there. And what we said is when you let shame in, you push peace out. These are the things that might be disturbing your peace. And then last week, Tom talked about guilt, 
guilt, this feeling like you owe someone, you have wronged someone. And guilt, the issue with guilt is when you keep guilt in, when you do nothing about it, you do nothing to try to resolve it, you also keep peace out, you push peace out. Out. And so while you might not think like these are the things that are disrupting my peace, it's amazing to see how when we deal with them, our lives become a little bit more peaceful. And so today we're talking about the thing that comes to mind most often when you think about peace being disturbed. We're talking about worry, stress, fear, anxiety, worry, things that keep you up at night, things that keep your mind racing, the things you carry like in your shoulders, back muscles, worry. Now, now it's worth saying before we go any further that uh, there's a medical condition. Like we talk about anxiety, there's a medical condition that has to do with the, the chemistry of the brain, right? That's not what we're talking about here. And I don't want to make little of that. What we're talking about is a pattern, a worrisome pattern of thinking And what we're asking is like, what can we do about that? What do you do with your worry? What do we do with our what ifs, our maybes, our might bes, like our our discomfort with what's unknown? How do we handle that? Worry, and, and you probably know this, worry has this ability of creeping into any and every area of life. You can worry about your kids, you can worry about your spouse, you can worry about your future, you can worry about school, you can worry about work, you worry about money, you worry about all, like anything you can think about, you can worry about. And it has this ability to just creep into areas of life. It can even, it can even creep into your dreams, your dreams. Anyone ever have a stress dream? You know, where you're like stressed out? How crazy is that? You know, like, I'm in bed, sleeping, you know, like not in danger, asleep. And yet, no, my, in my mind, something crazy is happening, right? Like maybe, uh, so I, I have this reoccurring dream. I've probably had it like 12 times where uh, it's the end of the semester. And I realize at the very end of the semester, there was this class that I never went to and never did any work for. And then I like wake up and I'm like, okay, good. I'm, I'm 32, right? Like... <laughs> Uh, Or maybe you've had like the dream when you're falling, you know? Uh, So Wednesday night, true story, Wednesday night, had a stress dream. Uh, I was in the dream. I was walking around in nature, you know, like peaceful, nice. And I was looking for my wife. And I come to this like bend, this little like bush or tree, shrub, like something. I'm turning the corner. I'm expecting to see my wife. And I turn the corner and it wasn't my wife. It was a bear, And the bear starts chasing me in my dream, right? And so I'm stressed in my dream. Now, a normal person would just be running away thinking I'm going to get eaten, but no, not me. I'm running. This will show you like the layers of dysfunction going on inside my head, right? I'm running and I'm thinking, was that a black bear or was that a grizzly bear? Because I think, I think with a black bear, you're supposed to make yourself really big and like yell, but I think with a grizzly bear, you're supposed to play dead. And so I'm running and I am stressing in my dream about a decision I have to make about how I'm going to lose my life once this bear gets me, right? And so worry, worry can be a problem and it can creep into any and every area of life. The word in the original language, the New Testament term for worry is actually the word care or concern, right? But in context... When we talk about worry, really, really, what we're talking about is the state of being consumed with concern. When, when we're anxious, when we have anxiety, in a way, like, it's actually a gift. It's a tool, right? Like, if there is something coming toward you, let's say there's a ball coming toward your face, right, and you see it. Your your body's going to have an anxious response, and what it's going to do is direct all of its focus to avoiding this potential threat, right? And so, like, your pupils are going to dilate, your heart's going to race, you're going to get ready to make a move and get out of the way of the ball. All your focus goes toward that, and that's a good thing, right? Like, when the ball's coming at you, you don't want to be thinking, like, well, how do I respond here? What am I going to eat for lunch? Like, everything is focused on that threat, But when we 
carry worry with us. It consumes us. And it's not just a ball coming at you. It's something out there, right? Like it, it, this is why, this is why you can be at your kid's basketball game and be thinking about a conversation you have, at, you have to have at work tomorrow. Right, we are consumed, we are focused on, even though we're not there, even though it's not happening, we're using our energy, we're focused on that potential threat. It's why like one of your friends could have this, could get a promotion or something really cool could happen, but instead of being there with them, all of a sudden your mind could go off to like, well, what's my future gonna be like? Because it consumes us, it demands our focus and it is exhausting. It's exhausting. The New Testament writers, they, they, Jesus and his early followers actually talk about worry as something that can choke you or something that you carry. It takes energy and it makes you tired. And so when we talk here about like, what do we do with worry? Right now, I, I really don't think we have the luxury of taking this lightly. Like some of us, the past two years, we have been carrying, carrying these worries, these fears. What are we gonna hear next? Like, am I really in danger? What's, go, what's the school gonna look like? What's work gonna look like? Am I still gonna have a job? We're carrying all of this uncertainty. And if you look around, if you're interacting with people on a regular basis, you'll see people are tired. They're burnt out. And it's because we've been carrying this worry. And so we need to know what to do with our worry. And we don't have the luxury of taking it lightly. So what do we do? One of Jesus's early followers, he wrote about what to do with anxiety. And what I'll tell you is that for me, for a really long time, this passage, it really meant nothing. It was like empty spiritual fluff. You know, we had a little plaque with this verse on it in my house. And when I saw it, like at times it would just give me more anxiety because I feel like, yeah, I know that that's what that says, but it really isn't doing anything for me. But when I came to understand what is actually going on in this passage, especially in the context that it's in all of a sudden something that meant like went from meaning nothing became insanely practical. And I think if you've been with us, you've probably heard us talk about this passage before, but if you haven't and you've been around church, you've probably heard this passage before. And maybe, maybe for you too, it's this feeling like, well, well I, you know, I saw that one coming, right? But my hope is that maybe we could look at it with like a little bit of a different lens today because, because, when we let worry in, we push peace out. And so Paul, one of the early followers of Jesus, he writes about this, and here's what he says. Are you ready? Here's what he says. He says, do not be anxious about anything. <laughs> it's like, man, you just broke the first rule of advice that you give to someone who's anxious. You don't tell an anxious person to not be anxious. Like, gee, thanks, Paul. Didn't think about that, right? He says, don't be anxious about anything, but he's not done. He gives us a but here, and this is where everything turns around. He says, but in every situation with prayer and petition, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then he says, and then he says, and here's our big word. He says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that's the passage, you know, that I had on like the little plaque in my house. Now, if we go back one verse, right, where he says, don't be anxious about anything. Uh, this word prayer, literally, it means prayer. Petition is another prayer word. Thanksgiving and present your requests. Those two are talking about prayer. However, this final term right here, present your requests, it's not a prayer word. It's used more often in the context of like solving a mystery. In essence, what, what Paul is saying here is to take 
your fear to the next level. Like go a little bit deeper. Our, our, our worries, they're like onions, right? They have layers. And what he's saying is to take it to the next layer. So for me, here, here's what this looked like, right? Or what this could look like. Imagine you've got a, a job interview, right? And you're all anxious and you've done what you can. You've, you've prepared yourself. You've learned about the company. You've you know, learned all the tips or whatever. And you're like, okay, it's time to, but I'm still really anxious. And so you stop and you hear this verse. You're like, okay, don't be anxious about anything. Just pray about everything, right? And so you pray, you're like, dear God, I'm anxious because I have a job interview. But why? Well, because I really want to get the job. But, but why, right? Take it another layer. Why? Well, because I feel like when I get this position, if I get this position, maybe I'll, I'll feel like more accomplished. I'll feel like significant. I feel like I'm, I matter. And maybe that's not the exact like thought process you would take, but, but if like all of a sudden when you get to the root of an issue, well, there's something you can work with. And, and you might see that your fear of the interview is actually connected to you worrying that you, your life doesn't mean anything. And if that's the case, then this job is not going to fix it. Like those two things don't have anything to do with one another, right? Or maybe, maybe you're worried about the country, I'm worried about what's going on in the country right now, whatever political view you have, just don't like the way things are. Why? So you, you pray about it. You like go layers deep. Well, I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about what kind of world they're going to grow up in. I'm worried about uh, if they're going to have the opportunity, uh, opportunities like I had to, to make money. If they're going to have what they need. If they're going to be financial stably or, or financially stable, yeah. Right, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you come to this point where now you're at something you can work with. Like, you don't have to go very far to see that, like, being rich really doesn't have too much to do with whether or not you're satisfied with life, right? And, and maybe, again, maybe for you, that's not the exact thought process. But my point is, if you go deeper and deeper, and de- eventually you'll see, this is what you do if you go see a therapist, eventually you'll see what's at the bottom of that anxious thought, and then you're given something to work with. And so maybe for you, like for me, there have been times where this works, where I pray and I get to the bottom, I'm like, you know, really, my issue is this. This is what I'm worried about, right? And sometimes that's enough for me to get up and feel like, oh, all right, you know, I can move on. I'm not, not so intimidated anymore. But sometimes it's not. And sometimes I can't quite get to the root of the issue, and I don't quite know why, and I don't know what the deal is, right? And so in that situation, what has been helpful to me is understanding that in saying this, in saying you can bring your request to God, we're not being told to just drop it. We're being told to hand it off, to pass it on, right? Like, Think about this. If you really care about something, you can't not care about it until you know that someone else is caring for it, right? But if you know that, then it doesn't worry you anymore. So think about it like this, right? Um, Here's a little visual if you like visuals. For me, uh, a couple years ago, maybe like three, four years ago at this point, my wife, Allie, and I, we like made some tough decisions and we decided, all right, we're going to go and we're going to try and start this church. And for me, like music, you know, it's a big part of church, not a big part of me. And when it comes to the whole music, I just have nothing, nothing to offer. One day we'll try it and you'll see, but I have nothing to offer. And so I'm thinking about the future. There's a lot of things we don't have, but I know we don't have music. And so I'm thinking about it. I'm like, man, right? Like there's this weight I'm carrying. It's like, well, we need, we need musicians, right? And we need instruments, and we're gonna, there's a lot of equipment we're going to need. And there's really like, uh, there's not too much I, I bring to the table. And so I've got this like really heavy load here. And everywhere I went, everywhere I went, this was on my mind. I go to a church and, and, and I was like part of a church service. And when the music people come up to do their thing, I'm like, oh gosh, 
What are, what are we going to do? What are we, I don't have, and, and someone would be like, hey, you're going to Starship? Be like, yeah, don't ask me about the music though. I don't know. Like if it's just me, we're going to be sitting in a circle, tambourine, doing kumbaya, right? Like I just, and it's just everywhere we went and I've got all these, there's so much that goes into it and I don't know any of it. It is out of my control. Until I started having breakfast with this beautiful man named Tom. <laughs> and we start talking, start talking about it, like our dreams and what the future could be. And, and at some point, Tom says, I'm in. And so I've got all these worries, right? And I don't just like drop them, I'm just like not caring about them. All of a sudden, I have the ability to hand them off to... <laughs> In the, in the first service, he fell down the stairs on that side, so he's gone. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but really, really, now, like, really, I can rest. I can rest. Not because I've just thrown my care to the wind, but because my cares are in the care of someone who can do something about it. And for us, some of us are walking around with concerns about our kids, concerns about our future, concerns about our health, concerned about things that are really out of our control. And, and God is not telling us just like, let them go. Like he, he's telling us we can hand them to him and know that they'll be cared for. Like, I, I got this, I, I'll, Take care of you. And it may not always work out exactly how you think it will, but it is in, it's in capable hands, hands that are more capable than yours. There's a pastor, his name's Craig Rochelle. He says he has a God box. And whenever he's worried about something, he writes that thing on a piece of paper and he puts it in his God box and he decides I'm not gonna worry about it anymore. And when the time comes, because it does, when he starts to worry about it again, he goes over to his God box and he takes it out as if to say, God, I don't trust you to take care of this for me. And for him, that's the thing that works. For me, I literally, I literally remember how I was so worried about the music side of this church and how when I handed it off, it was like in good hands. Now I don't have to worry anymore. I don't have to worry about all the details. I know it's gonna be taken care of. And maybe for you, like maybe you need a box or maybe you need to remember the feeling of handing off a responsibility to someone who is capable and know, okay, like it's going to be taken care of. Maybe not in the exact way I want it to be, but it's not out of care, right? It's, it hasn't just been dropped, it's been picked up by someone else. And so like we can say, we can say, and we said this almost a year ago, we'll say it the exact same way, God's control plays a major role the fact that God is in control of things I can't control, that plays a major role in the protection of your peace, in you having peace when you can't control something. Now, I told you, I'm a pretty skeptical person. And for me, like pretty quickly, I was able to poke holes in this argument. Like that verse and the peace that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus, right? Like that's the verse that's put on the plaque. It's like pinned on the Pinterest board. It's the background wallpaper on your phone. It's like, that sounds real good. But for me, it just didn't really like quite solve the problem. Uh, when I was in high school, I, I stressed out a lot about tests, you know? And I didn't always do well on tests. And so I prayed a lot about my tests. And I also had a cousin who went to the same school and he did a lot better on his tests. And I think I prayed more than he did about the test, right? The difference was the night before, I was like on you know, MySpace or playing Madden or what, and he was up studying, right? And so I thought like, okay, hold on a second here. Like, really, there seems to be another element to that. And if you're critical like me, like this, for me, solved that issue. And even if you're not on board with the whole church thing, if you're like, I'm not quite sure if God can be trusted, this can be extremely helpful for you. Paul goes on, he's not done. The plaque shouldn't end there. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, finally, meaning there's one more thing, meaning the last thing I said was not the last 
thing. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, this is pretty good. He says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then he goes on and he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, he taught them a lot of things, or seen in me, put it into practice. And you know what he says after that? He says, and the God of peace will be with you. If you like to study these things, they say you should look for repetition, right? This is, he's sandwiching this passage into peace words here. He's saying, yes, you praying and handing off your worries, things you can't control to God, that does play a role. But the way you think and the way you live can also play a huge role in your peace. In other words, we might say, yes, in part one, God's control plays a major role in the protection of your peace, but also your control plays a major role in the protection of your peace. The first part is how you think, how you think. Like whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is praiseworthy, excellent, all those positive words. He's not saying like pie in the sky, pretend everything bad is good. He's saying choose to see the good. It's the idea of disciplined thought. Some of us, including myself, will let our thoughts run wild. Like if I start to let my mouth run wild, it's not very long before I realize I'm getting myself into some trouble here, right? If I just do whatever I want, it's not very long before I realize I might be getting myself into some trouble here. But I can go and lock myself in my room and just unravel meant, right? Like just go down a horrible, dark rabbit hole about every possible thing that could go wrong. And there's no sense of urgency to stop it. What Paul's saying here is hundreds, even thousands of years ahead of his time. We know now from a psychological, from a neurological standpoint, when you think a thought or in a certain way in your brain, there's a neurological pathway that is formed, like a path in the woods. And the more that you travel that path, the more that path gets worn and the easier it is for you to think that way. That's why a lot of your positive friends tend to be mostly positive about most things. And a lot of your negative friends tend to be mostly negative about most things. It's because they have trained themselves to think that way. And what Paul is saying here is that that is a huge part of our peace. It's not like spinning it to turn it into something. It's recognizing the good that's in front of you. And sometimes we don't see it because we're not looking for it. My daughter, she's seven, but a few years ago, she was running with a kite She's in the backyard running. I don't think it was flying, but it was just kind of dragging it. And the kite just breaks and the end of it falls off and she just got a string. And she stops running. She turns around and she goes, I used to have a kite, but now I have a rope. And then she just keeps running. And like, I heard that story. My wife told me that. And I'm like, she doesn't realize how healthy that way of thinking is. Just recognizing what's in front of her. It's disciplined, it's th- disciplined thought. And, and my, my hope when you hear this part of the passage is that if nothing else, you recognize the danger of going down one of those dark rabbit holes. And may, like do whatever you can to snap at. Maybe you just get, you, rec- you feel you're going to a dark place, get up and go watch a movie. Go eat some ice cream. Like just, but, but don't let yourself keep going because that will destroy your peace. And then, And then the second part, right? Like how you think can undermine your peace, but how you live can undermine your peace. That's been our whole series. He says, the things I taught, what you've seen in me, what you've learned from me. He's talking about things like anger, things like guilt, things like shame, things like pride. These are things, if we let them into our lives, they will rot our peace. They will disturb our peace. It is very possible. It is very possible that Some of your habits, some of your your patterns in life right now, maybe right or wrong, may not be, but they could be undermining your peace. And sometimes things are in God's control, like especially in the church, we love to say like, oh, just don't worry, just give it to God. But sometimes we need to take responsibility for things. 
I think I mentioned this before, but a few years ago, like I realized my wife and I, we were like constantly, finances were constantly a point of tension in the relationship. And it got to a point where I was like, you know what? I think I need to stop praying about finances and start learning about finances. And, and that has, has like made a huge change in our relationship because that's part that I, I am in control of, that I'm in control over. The other thing is how much you consume and what you consume. If you listen to the news all day long, it will ruin your peace. I've said before, like there was once a time where someone in North Dakota steals a banana from a 7-Eleven and you never find out about it and the world keeps spinning, right? But now somebody does that and it's like, bing, banana stolen in North Dakota from 7-Eleven and it's right in front of you and it's on your phone. And when you walk into 7-Eleven the next day, instead of thinking like, this place is like heaven on earth, right? They've got everything I could possibly imagine right here. You think like dangerous things happen in this place. It really does affect the way that you think. If you're on social media all day, like now th- there's concrete evidence that shows us it, it can do damage to your mental health. It's because we're comparing our behind the scenes to everybody's highlight reel. And so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying don't, be, but we have to be aware of how much we're consuming. It's like candy. I'm not saying don't eat candy, I love, but you have to know if you're eating a lot of it because eventually it's gonna take its toll on you. There's a new uh, widget on the iPhone, right? It's a little thing you could put on your home screen. Uh, I don't know if they have it on Android phones because I don't go into that dark shadowy place. Uh, But, just kidding, Uh, but seriously. There's a widget, there's a widget, and you can connect it with your photos. And like every day, I pick up my phone, several different times a day, and, and it picks a different photo, and it's always like a memory. You know, and it might be like the day my, my son like, you know, smashed his smash cake on his birthday or a time we went away together as a family. And they come, and it's like the exact opposite of social media. It, it shows you the good that's in your life rather than you going and seeing what everybody else is doing with, you know, the Valencia filter. We, 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 we really really do have control over our peace. And it, it's affected by the way that we think, the way that we do, and the way that we live. And so here's where we'll wrap up. I'll call the band up here. Peace internally requires us to be brutally honest about what's in our control and what we need to hand off to God. God. And if you, if you don't believe any of this, right? Like if you don't know if God can be trusted, if you're like, no, someone dragged you here today, someone twisted your arm, this is like not for me. Like trusting something to God is a great opportunity to increase your faith. Like it takes faith to hand something off and say, you know what, I'm gonna choose not to worry about it. But when you see it, there, it may not be exactly how you think it should work out, but when you see there's a sense like that was taken care of, It takes faith, but it also makes faith. And so my question for you, no matter where you are in your faith right now, is like what, if just one thing, what's one thing that you're worried about? And is it something that you need to hand off or something that you need to take control over? The more we ask those questions, the more honest we are with ourselves, the closer we'll be to understanding that peace of God that Paul talks about, the peace that surpasses understanding, the more we'll feel like the God of peace is with us.